Health and Human Services Committee on Thursday, March 23rd. We have uh, several bills on the agenda today. Senator Wickley to 2819. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senate File 2819 is the Department of Human Services policy bill, and there is an A2 amendment that was just distributed that is a delete everything. So I'd like to move the A2 amendment. Madam Chair. Senator Abler. Um, would you please give us the courtesy of describing the differences? This thing is timestamped last night at 8.37. Um, I didn't even know it was out there. So could you just like tell us, I've studied 2819 in its base form, and I'm sure there's nothing clever, but it would just be, I think, polite to help us know just like what are the key differences that requires a delete all instead the, of just an amendment. Mm, Madam Chair, um, Sen Senator Abler, we will be going through the amendment. That is your plan. Um, to, uh, Mr. Burdick is going to go through it. Um, if you want, he can go through it, and then, I mean, I, we can adopt it. I mean, it's, I can't tell you exactly the differences because he needs right. to go through that. Well, so. which is just in Senator consideration Abler. of the process, I would really appreciate that. Um, Senator Abler, I think, you know, what we've been doing so far in this committee is if it's a delete all, especially, they're going to talk about the entire bill anyways. So at this point, I would just uh, recommend that we move the A2. Uh, Madam Chair, I request a Senator roll call Wicklin's and I want to play. This is wrong. This is not the way to do business. This things are moving fast anyway. I've made a respectful request on Senator a major Abler. amendment that's not even 12 hours old. We definitely appreciate your request, and I see what you're <clears throat> saying, but we're going to talk about the entire bill anyway, so whether we adopt it now or 10 minutes from now, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Uh, it, makes, it makes a real difference in the, the process, mm -hmm. and, I, and I, we can spend time talking about this, but we can just let them go through the, at least there's, there's probably some key differences between this amendment and the base amendment, maybe just a few things that have read better to make it one big change, but it's, it's not fair to the public, it's not fair to me. Well, lastly, Senator, we've, all, we've heard all these bills already. They've been through our committee. There's nothing new. And research can testify to that as well. So we've actually all, we've heard all these bills. Oh, Madam Chair, and so Senator Wicklund, why do we need to delete all then off of the bill that we're doing? Is this like a way different, are we not doing half of the department's bill? And this is adding in our own. If you just, just, just explain it, then I can just stop. I, I just... What, what we pride ourselves on here is representing the people and helping them understand what we're doing. And I have no idea what we're doing. And I can't imagine anybody at home who's watching this has any idea what this amendment has. It was time stamped 837 last night. Mm -hmm. It would have been interesting if maybe the staff would have said, by the way, here, Jim, here's the amendment for tomorrow. Uh, you might want to look at this so you can be prepared and, or call attention. We were here at 830 last night, or just about. And you could have said there's a big delete all coming. Be sure you check your email or something besides whenever it was posted. I, I just don't understand why we have to do it this way. Mm, Madam Chair. Senator Wicklin. Um, Senator Abler, I, I think that we are going to go through the bill thoroughly. And so we are not going to leave the public out of that process. Um, as for how early we can get the amendment posted, Council is extremely busy this week, and we are trying to get things processed and posted as quickly as possible, and working with the department to get the information as quickly as possible, and it is being done as, as fast as we can. But we are not trying to gloss over or, or not go through what the department wishes to present as their um, policy bill we did hear all of the, the bills that are included in this, and I'm sure that Mr. Burdick is going to highlight um, each, you know, all of the things that are in it if we adopt this amendment now. Madam Thank Chair. you. Senator Adler. All you have to do is just go through the highlights of the differences, and I think I and the public would be happy that you would allow that. Otherwise, I'm going to request a roll call on the amendment. And I'm gonna, I just, I don't know why we have to take it to this point. I don't understand. We, we, we ran to work together and get things done, to collaborate, to do the best for all of us. And you're asking me to put my vote on something, I have no idea what it is. And I will I swear that nobody in this audience knows what that is, unless they happen to have noticed their email 
or the, they looked at the posting last night after 9 o'clock. I just don't think it's a good process. I didn't come to dust up today, Madam Chair. I came to do good work. Senator and I'm just shocked there's this big bleed all, and I just don't, I don't think that's the way to do business. And so if you just honor my request, and if Mr. Burdick go through a two-minute thing, like what are the main differences, and if there's more minor differences, we can discuss those. And I think you can have it the best of both worlds that way, Madam Chair. Senator? Um, Madam Chair, we can do that. Um, I would just say that our process is that <clears throat> author's amendments and delete alls, we are usually moving them, and that is the process in the Senate, not just this committee. So I, I will allow um, Mr. Burdick, if you could spend um, a couple minutes, if you want to highlight differences, and then we can adopt the amendment, and then we will go thank through you, it. Madam Chair, thank you very much. I appreciate your your courtesy. Mr. Burdick. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, committee, for the time today. Matt Burdick with the Department of Human Services, and I will very briefly describe what is contained in this delete all amendment, and um, as the discussion has illustrated, there are very few changes from the legislation you've seen before, but I'll go over specifically which bills are contained in this delete all, and then highlight a few differences, and then happy to stand for any questions the committee has. So this committee, or excuse me, this bill is made up of three of the department's bills that this committee has heard. Senate File 2819, which was our Office of Inspector General Policy and Technical Bill, as well as Senate File 2356, which was another policy bill from our Office of Inspector General focused on children and families, primarily child care programs. And those two bills make up the content of Article 1. I will say there are a few provisions that you heard originally that have since been removed. Those are provisions that needed to be heard in the Judiciary Committee, and we're going to revisit those next year. We've also made a change. The committee heard testimony from the Hospital Association around some changes around medical necessity review, and we've made some changes to attempt to address those concerns. I will say I have not confirmed with the Hospital Association that they are 100 percent good with this language, but we will before this bill um, language would be to pass into law. And specifically, you heard about uh, concerns around requiring uh, providers to immediately provide paperwork upon request, and we've changed, we've removed that requirement, and then also changed um, a timeline from 30 to 45 days to address specifically the concerns that you all heard in testimony. And so those are the con those are the changes within Article One. Within Article Two, this contains Senate File 1893, which was our Children and Family Services Policy and Technical Bill, and there are not any adjustments from the original bill other than the amendment that was adopted in this committee. And this addresses technical and housekeeping changes related to statutes governing child protection, child support, and the SNAP program. And I'd be happy to answer any specific questions members have about the provisions contained in this delete all. Thank you, Mr. Burdick. Any questions, members? Madam Chair, thank Senator you very much. Thank you. Uh, with that, motion is to adopt the A2 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The amendment is adopted. Um, and I will say, uh, going forward today, I would just like to adopt any author's amendments, um, as we have historically been doing. Um, Senator Wickland, please proceed. Um, Madam Chair, I, I would like to see if there are additional detailed questions people have about the, the bill, as um, Mr. Burdick has let you know which bills these are provisions from, um, if you have specific questions about them, or if you wish to have him go through um, any of the articles, or both of the articles, that's fine with me. But I, I don't have further comments. Members, questions? Madam Chair. Senator. Good morning. Next we can be here together. Um, I just have, I don't, I don't, I mean, the decision to go with a delete all compared to amending a bill is a decision that gets made for all kinds of reasons, but I don't even know if my questions are in the bill that remains. But under the old um, online, uh, now 37.16 on contraindicated physical restraints. Um, it was on page 27 of the old bill. Um, it, it talks about uh, that they, you know, this prone restraint uh, situation um, is a certainly problematic, uh, uh, especially at you know, certain times when that's like horrible. Um, but there was a, 
So th there are some individuals who need to be restrained. They're hitting somebody and the staff is at harm. Uh, at uh, corrections, they're allowed to actually grab the person. At AMRTC, they're not allowed to grab the person. They have to do deflecting things, and a great number of injuries happen to the staff because of that. Um, in the education bill, a person who restrains a person physically must report that to the Department of Education, which I think is a problem with that change. Uh, can you tell me how 37, what, 16 to 21 relate to that? And is this, there's a person who's physically harming people, and can you, it says, not, it says it must not implement a restraint, and does that just mean, I'm hoping that we can common sensely tell a person to have them not hit people anymore and, and kind of hang on to them to stop that. But does, do you, does this have any effect on that situation? Mr. Burdick. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Abler. What this provision is doing is expanding existing prohibitions on prone restraints to additional uh, setting types. But I might call up um, one of our policy experts here to get into some more of the details on this provision, if that's all so, right with you. But my, my question, really, I don't need a lot of background, but just... Um, so on 3717, must not implement a restraint. Is, is that related to a prone restraint, as is discussed in the rest of the bill, or is that any restraint? Maybe if we, if we need to talk about it, we can. But. Uh, Madam Chair. Mr. Burdick. Senator Abler, this is specific to prone restraints. Okay, and that's, and that's Madam Chair. And, and that's clear to everybody. I mean, does that need to be saying prone restraint, just to make sure people know that's what they're getting at, or is it clear to anybody who knows this topic that you really mean pro the streams? Uh, Senator Abel, what line are you looking at? Uh, line 37.17. In the, in the DE? Yeah, in the DE. Madam oh. Chair, Ms. Ms. or Senator Abler, I mean, Section 25 is prone restraint prohibition. Um, All right. I, yeah, and it apply, that's the entire um, section. Yeah, so subdivision three is all prone, and then subdivision four, 37, 16, and 17, must not implement a restraint on a person in a way that contradicts their known medical or psychological condition. So right. it's not just a blanket, do not apply restraints, if that makes well, sense. Well, but just, Madam Chair, yeah, so on line 37, seven, it talks about prone restraint. On line, um, it uses the word prone. I just uh, don't want somebody caught up in this accidentally. It is there. And I think it would be useful just to clarify, just to add the word prone, and, and maybe if I can offer an oral amendment just to put the word prone in front of restraint on line 37.17, just to make sure that there's no doubt about it. Th line 37.7? 17. Oh, 17. After the word, I'll just insert the word prone, and then... Am I on the right bill? Yeah, 30, yeah. Contraindicated physical restraint. I, I don't think that subdivision four is prone. I think it's just subdivision three, but I will let council answer that. Well, that no, that's my question. Yes. Is, that's, is this only prone restraints? Or, um, so I mean, um, I, I just don't want to have it be that somebody can't hold somebody who's hitting somebody and maybe will choke them to death and they can't, they have to keep their hands off. So that's all. I, nobody talked to me about this, but I just, this is an issue. And Senator Hoffman knows a lot about this. Uh, Madam Chair, committee members, uh, subdivision four, starting on page 37, line 16, applies to all restraints as defined on line 37.3. Madam Chair. Mr. Burdick. Um, Senator Abler, to your question, and apologies, I misspoke. I was reading the wrong line here. Still haven't had enough coffee. Um, Senate Council is correct about the, um, the nature of that particular provision. However, I think to the point you're getting at, when someone's in an emergency, a restraint is still allowed. That's under our positive supports rule. And so people can intervene in emergency situations and just need to end that restraint as soon as the emergency situation has um, resolved itself. Again, this is not intending to expand kind of the, the nature of what types of restraints aren't allowed to be used and when. It's really it's making sure that they apply to all license setting types. All right. Senator. Well, I just, you heard my concern about this, and so I represent AMRTC. We have picketed out there um, 
about injuries to workers. And this is now covering a whole spate of sites that, um, and some of these individuals are indeed likely to be aggressive. And I just want to make sure that someone's not going to be like losing their license for just trying to protect their coworker from somebody who's punching them in the nose 10 times, that's all. And Madam so. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Burdick. Uh, and Senator Abler, this particular provision does not apply to AMRTC. Okay. But it, thanks. And so, um, you know, just there was a time when we were briefed on some of these bills, and so we could ask questions uh, privately, and I know there's a lot of things happening, but, um, but so I just want, at least if legislative intent would be that we intend that people can protect themselves. It's an issue in schools, I think. You can't even hold a kid sometimes, so. All right, well, that's, I guess I'll leave that go for now, Madam Chair. Senator Hoffman. Thank you. Um, this gets to the conversation, uh, Mr. Burdick, you know, when, the, when there was a certain case in, out of Cambridge, Minnesota, that, that uh, ruling by a federal judge that talked about restraints um, actually went across all sectors, not just in the world of the Department of Human Services. And there was a clearly a misunderstanding. There were some school districts, to Senator Abler's point, that, you know, holding on to a child in front of the school bus um, was not allowed in some school districts because they said, oh, you're doing a physical restraint. And um, I guess getting to the, the intent of that piece of it, right, I, I don't, we don't ever want to see another situation where an individual was put into a five-point restraint because he touched a pizza box. If you want to look at the discovery notes of the Mito case, that's an actual one. Or I wanted a glass of milk at 8.05 p.m. and my program ended at 8 p.m. and I was perseverating on the fact that I just wanted a glass of milk and they told the individual, um, <clears throat> it's a well-documented case, uh, to, to uh, assume the position. He was so well trained in, in restraints. He was restrained, I believe the count was 352 times in one year. And so, I, you know, in this piece, are we going to be pretty clear on helping um, everybody across the spectrum understand the, the def definition of what you're trying to put in here? And to, to Senator Euler's point, there is some confusion. And, and believe me, there, is, there was confusion down the ladder after the Jensen settlement to court. I mean, anybody want to read about that? I, there's a few people in this room that were part of that. So, um, uh, you know, help, help understand that confusion that sits out there, I think would be helpful here for, for what Senator Taylor's getting to. Thoughts? Mr. Yes. Burdick. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Hoffman. I appreciate that question and those comments. We have been working with license holders that were not previously subject to this as we've developed this legislation to make sure people are aware that this is coming and obviously um, as part of the licensing process and our ongoing technical assistance to providers, helping people understand what the rules are is very important. We don't want to just have a punitive approach to how we relate to our provider community. We want make, to make sure people know how to follow the regulations and do so successfully. Thank you, Mr. Burdick. Um, and again, this language does not say that you cannot implement restraints. It just says that you cannot do that if it's contraindicated to a person's known medical or psychological condition. So if someone has a broken arm, you can't put them in restraints with a broken arm behind their back, right? That's how I'm reading this language. And Madam Chair. Senator Abler. And, I, I, and so I appreciate the discussion. This is not a, we have spent no time talking about restraints in this committee, and it's, it's an appropriate discussion and certainly our topic. Uh, I'm, just as long as Mr. Burdick explained, and nobody wants to do restraints for somebody who's contraindicated, um, but there is an emergency situation where somebody who's got a psychological, you know, thing that would contraindicate a restraint for a reason, but if they're hitting somebody and causing the potential for harm in an emergency sitting, that becomes an emergency, now you can actually you know, attempt to physically stop them from doing that and based upon other areas. And so just, just to make sure people know that, and Senator Hoffman pointed out pretty eloquently, uh, that there's a, there's a, it's too bad that some people are so wrong in how they do it that common sense doesn't prevail. If there was common sense, there would be no need for Jensen. There would be no need for any of this information because a, a reasonable person in a reasonable situation is going to use the lowest amount of restraint they could possibly have. So anyway, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, other questions? Seeing none. Madam Chair. I have Senator Abler. 
Um, anyway, so on the old draft on line 50.13, it talked about service, how things are served. I don't know where that is in the new draft, um, but I can describe my question. And service has been an issue in the past, uh, how you serve a notice to somebody. Um, there was once an effort on the part of the department to say if you mail a letter, that's considered service, and you don't even know if it got there. And so this may be even what we worked on way back then, where you had to do a, 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 a um, certified mailing. And um, the old 50.13 has to do, um, that, that's section 41 of the old bill. I, if you can point me to that in the new bill, I, or I can just ask you on the old draft. And, is section is subdivision four of section forty one still in the bill in the delete all? Anyway, it requests, Madam Chair, it just it, 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 it takes away that the commissioner shall place an affidavit of certified mailing in the file. And I don't know why you would do that. Because if there's a question later that they certify mailed it to the wrong place and you don't even live there anymore, and somebody some person living there says, oh yeah, I can sign for that. Um, there's no real mailing. And so I just was curious why that had to be stricken. Mr. Burdick? Um, Senator, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, I think the language that you're looking for may start on line 72.1. I don't believe that language has changed from the initial draft. Right. And so why would you, Mr. Madam Chair, thank you. It's on yeah, 72.1 to 72.5. And the specific lines are 0.3 to 0.5. Um, and so why would you just not want to put that in the file? And Mr. Burdick, I realize you're just here as a messenger, but why would somebody in the department think they don't want to hang on to that really important piece of documentation? Mr. Burdick. Um, Madam Chair, I may try to phone a friend here if there's anyone available to help here. Otherwise, I'll have to get back to you on that question, Senator. Right. We have exhausted my depth of knowledge no, on this particular and I, topic. But I, and so, Madam Chair, I, I, I think we're being friendly here. I, I just think, as a you want to, that I'm sure that the chair has not reviewed this section because um, it's all there's so much paper here. But I, but I, I think as a committee, we would want not we would not want somebody put in a position where they're going to lose their license because a certified letter got served and somebody signed for it and they never got it. Um, and so that's my request. So anyway. Welcome. Good afternoon. Good morning. Jennifer Hasbargen with the Department of Human Services, Office of Inspector General. And I'm Anna Novak, Office of Inspector yeah. General, DHS. Chairman, uh, Senator Abler, I was with uh, you the session. We were talking about that a couple of years ago. Uh, and we ended up um, doing something that added more than there was before. The way the statute reads now, you have to do certified mailing as well as affidavit of service. This amendment um, keeps the affidavit or maintains the certificate of mailing so that we would have that record of the certificate itself, but it added basically we're doubling up on proof of service. We have both the certificate and an affidavit of service, and it's an additional administrative burden. Um, so to answer your question, there would be proof of service through the certificate of mailing. Um, having an affidavit in addition is just doubling up, I guess is the best way I could put it. Right. Ms. Novak, anything you want to add? Nothing to add. Yeah. Well, it's just if you're here long enough, you get to see your own, your favorite bill get repealed. So uh, here we are, it's just funny to actually remember the conversation that we had. Um, and so I'm just, I'm always just thinking about somebody who's doing their job and, you know, and you, you guys try to do everything. So if a person says, they suddenly realize you quit paying them and, well, you took your license away and we told you, you know, like, you didn't tell me. And is there a way they can go back and go like, that's the address you used? and um, it, and so there's a, there's a record of where you sent things, and so it, this is, just takes away an extraneous thing, but there's still a way to prove that they weren't even living there, or that that was a wrong address altogether. Ms. Novak? Senator Abler, uh, we use the enrollment records that they provide, so if they yeah. update their address, we, we use the address that they put on as their correspondence address, where we send it certified mail and regular mail. Um, if it comes back to us, we 
make an effort to find a new address or a correct address. Um, but we then have that certified mail receipt. If it comes back and it's returned to sender, we keep that on file as well. All right, well, Madam Chair. Um, so heaven forbid the department ever have the wrong address, that they just, somebody picked the wrong file and sent it to the wrong place. But if, if for some reason, and they should update their addresses, let's say they do all that, but you just happen to, for some reason, get a number wrong or something, and it's the, and somebody's, there's a way, in the record, it's going to be clear what address you sent the thing to. So when they try to appeal, like what happened, then you could still figure it out. That if you can tell me that's true, then I'll let you get rid of this extraneous work. You know. I'm Senator Abler. If we have the wrong address, we make a typo in the address. We would resend and give them their appeal rights. We would resend that. We would withdraw the original notice due to that error and resend it out. Yeah. Well, no, but Madam Chair. I'm, Nobody found out. It got mailed out, and some person signed for it because they thought they had a sign for what the postman brings. Uh, and it's not even that person. You would never know that they didn't get it. But suddenly they're in trouble with their license, and they go like, huh. Um, and, and then, but there's a way for you to look at the records and see what address you used, and they can go, then, then you, can, you can at least give them some mercy on what they didn't even know, right? Uh, uh, Chairwoman, uh, Senator Abler, the record in the Notice of Agency Action would, ma would have the address yeah. that it was mailed to, and the Certificate of Mailing would have the address it was mailed to, and both of those would be maintained as part of the record with the Department uh -huh. of Human Services. All right. Well, thanks, ma'am. We, we uh, constituents get a hold of us sometimes about <laughs> stuff that happened, and we pass a law to fix this sort of thing, and so as we're unfixing I things, I, I appreciate your patience. And I have one more question after this. Go ahead. Madam Chair. Thank you. That's helpful, and I guess I'll just Thanks. let you uh, continue with your reforms. Uh, on, the re on the repealer side, um, um, on 2R of the old, um, are you still repealing the, uh, on page 2R, the notification of the set-aside or variance? Is that still in the repealer? Or is that not anymore? Mr. Burdick. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, could you repeat exactly which provision you're Oh, yeah, so on, it's on the old version, uh, line page 2R, the 245C.301 notification of set aside or variance, you have to post that. Is that no longer in the bill? Madam Chair. Mr. Burdick. Uh, Senator Abler, uh, that repealer is still contained in this bill. Okay. I have a question about that then. Um, Senator. And so uh, this, uh, I think I remember when we passed this, um, this says you have to let people know that you have a set-aside or a variance so that the parents can know that this individual um, had some past that was important. It could be a substantial um, past. Um, and we were just worried about informed, you know, if any people want to go there still, knowing this person has some past situation that required a lot of activity by the part of the department is as a even potentially criminal act or as a you know harm to somebody uh, they could still go there so can you tell me why you want to get rid of that mr. Burdick uh, madam chair senator Abler it's my understanding that this was uh, feedback that we received from the federal government about what information we can and cannot share and so this is to conform with their guidance senator Abler well wow. um, Well, and Mr., I, I think we should talk about it. You might want to, people should look at this section. Uh, this just says, it's not the department releasing information. It says the family child care provider and centers uh, must provide this to parents. And so no one's sharing it but them. And I think for protection to the public, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't have, the energy to go through what sort of things they might have to disclose, but some of these are pretty serious. And we've done, the reason they have a whole OIG is for people that are doing bad things to minors and, and that have a history of some things. And if they're, and we, I also believe in rehabilitation and I believe in second chances, but um, I, I'm troubled by that. I don't have, I'm not gonna move to it, delete it, but I, I really think uh, Madam Chair uh, and the childcare community and the advocates need to look at that. Um, 245C.03 
Um, and it, but it, and we also worked on this, I remember. And then we, so we didn't, if you have a child who's not related to child care work, um, and there's some uh, misdemeanor theft, we didn't worry about that. And I, I just remember working on this. And I thought we were pretty happy that people could be informed, that they would know what their center is like and who they're hiring. So I just, met, Madam Chair, if you would just look into this and make sure you think it's something, and rather than just a convenience, because the federal government makes us do it, I, um, they have no business running Minnesota, in my opinion. Madam Chair, that's all the questions I have. Mr. Burdick. And uh, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, just in response to that, uh, completely appreciate um, the frustration around this and happy to follow up with the federal law citation at issue here. I will say, having spent far too much time working on background studies issues over the past several years, the federal government is uh, painfully bureaucratic, and I say that as a longtime bureaucrat. <laughs> Members, uh, other discussion? Seeing none, um, Senator Wicklin, would you like to make a motion to uh, for Senate File 2819 as amended be recommended to pass? That is my motion. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion prevails. Thank you. To Senate File 2966. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 2966 is the DHS um, governor's budget bill, and I believe that we have, um, Elise Bailey is going to be going through a presentation, and you have that in your materials. So I will let her get set up. Senator, there is the A23 amendment. Oh, yeah, yep. And I don't know if you... Um, My presentation is around the revised, so if you wanted to do the amendment first. Either way to come. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you, can you talk about the, the amendment? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, uh, members of the committee, uh, Chairman, uh, my name is Elise Bailey, Budget Director for the Department of Human Services, and I'm just going to do a very, very brief overview of our revised budget recommendations. The amendment before you is, um, are those revised budget recommendations along with um, some technical corrections um, that need to be made to the initial budget. Um, so without further ado, I know you have a lot of testifiers here uh, to talk about what's contained in the bill, and so I'm planning to just be extremely brief um, on just what's been added to um, the bill. So I, um, earlier this year, we came in and kind of talked about our initial budget and, and what were the founding principles behind it. Um, and so I just, I kept these two slides in here to remind the committee of what our founding principles are um, in the governor's budget. One, in that we're really looking to have a package centered on the people that we serve in our programs and really fundamentally improving um, the system as a whole. All of the partners that are um, important in making the system move and uh, making a, a positive impact on the people that um, are served on our programs. Um, these are our package pillars again, um, so just wanted to keep these front of mind as we go through um, the bill. So just a quick summary of our total package. So this crosses um, both jurisdictions, um, but our total package is 4.9 billion over the budget horizon. This is about 300 million more um, than our initial budget. 
And the next slide goes into this committee itself. So it's about 2.9 billion over the horizon um, with 74 um, distinct proposals. Um, so quickly going into the new and revised proposals in this jurisdiction. Um, so in this revised budget, we have a new proposal on MFIP sanction reform and housing assistance. So the Minnesota Family Investment Program has a benefit of $110 per month that assists families with kids for the cost of housing. This was a benefit that got added in 2015. However, that value hasn't changed since then. Um, so this proposal increases that value every year based on inflation starting in October of this year. Um, you'll note on the slide that while it hasn't increased, the, the fair market rent over the same time period has gone up 42%. So we're really aiming to um, set this benefit up for folks and index it to inflation. So we were setting it up in the future to, to fully assist families. Um, the other part of this proposal modifies the sanctions that are contained in the Minnesota Family Investment Program. The sanctions policies that we have are extremely complicated, um, and so what we have in our proposal, and if you want to take a detailed look on the change page, um, multiple components to these to just really encourage um, compliance with the programs, but also um, balancing um, predictability and administrative ease for our tribal and county workers. Um, so we think that these reforms would increase um, client engagement, lessen the workload at our local governments, um, increase consistency and integrity, um, and can be better automated um, for both the participant and the worker. We also have a new proposal around hospice respite and end of life care for kids on MA. So this proposal establishes a new benefit under medical assistance um, that's state funded only to cover hospice respite or and end of life care for kids under uh, 21. Um, and then lastly, we have a few additions to existing proposals. Um, so we have a proposal on increasing healthcare access for Minnesotans, and this proposal contains a lot of um, key elements that would just make um, ease ease uh, people's experience on the um, Minnesota healthcare programs. And what we added in the revised is an online consumer and assister portal um, that would enable people to self-report changes uh, um, and their documents online rather th through paper. It would also um, enable people to elect to receive notices via text and email rather than getting them in the mail. Huge improvements to our Minnesota healthcare program. Um, and then lastly, we um, had an existing proposal around compliance and continuous improvement at the department. And what we added to this is to create an externally facing system that grantees can go into to apply for all RFPs um, in the DHS landscape. So right now it's um, each one they're applying individually and we would like to have a um, technical system where they can apply in a seamless way. Um, and then in the back end, um, DHS can process them um, more quickly. And that was a very brief run through. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. Members, any questions about the presentation? Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Senator Wicklund. Madam Chair, I just also wanted to point out that there is a budget bill index in your packet, um, and that incorporates the new I'm assuming that Correct. the new proposals and you know the existing pr proposals that the governor brought forward earlier this session. So that's all within, there's a 2023 DHS, HHS budget bill index. Very good. Um, with that, Senator Wicklin, would you like to move the A23? Um, yes, Madam Chair. And Madam Chair. Senator Abler. So I understand this is the governor's additions. That's all this, that's what this amendment is basically. Uh, the amendment contains the governor's um, new proposals, and then you said that um, Ms. Bailey said there's technical corrections to the the original budget proposals. Senator, that's all I need. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think it's a great amendment. I think we should all vote for it. All those in favor of the A23 signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed. The amendment is adopted to the bill as amended. Um, Madam Chair, um, I. I'm available for questions, or Ms. Bailey is available for questions. We wanted to highlight the, the items that are new. Um, we had the presentation on the original budget proposals. Um, 
and it seems like a long time ago, but it wasn't <laughs> that long ago. Uh, but if you have questions about those or the new proposals, um, stand for questions. Members, questions? Seeing no questions. Uh, we will go ahead and lay over 2966. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. 2212. Um, Madam Chair, 22, Senate File 2212 is the um, MDH policy bill vehicle. And I'm not sure. Um, yes, Ms. Timian, do you have a presentation too? Oh, okay. And I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Timian to walk through the bill. And we have this case, we have the A3 amendment, which is a delete everything amendment. And we have, we don't have an index. No, nothing. Okay. We have that here. Would Ma you, go ahead. Madam Chair, members of the committee, for the record, Lisa Timian, Department of Health. Um, this uh, A3 amendment just reflects several policy bills that the committee has heard over the past few weeks, um, including um, capital expenditures review, the uh, two hearing aid bills, uh, one requir requiring coverage and one requiring over-the-counter, uh, amending use of the all-payer claims database, the Rural Health Advisory Committee expansion, um, the stillbirth, amending the stillbirth uh, certificates language, the lead service line status definitions, um, facilities guidelines, institute definitions for hospital construction, um, lead hazard reduction, renovation standards. There was a bill that I believe is um, the opioid antagonist, which is our policy bill. Um, as well as third-party transport of medical cannabis, as well as a DHS provision. Madam Chair, Senator I, I neglected to say these are all bills that we heard in the committee um, compiled into one, um, one vehicle so that we can pass this to the floor and then um, meet up with the House. Thank you, Senator. Uh, to the motion of adopting the A3, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The amendment is adopted. Members, questions? Senator Amler. Uh, just a question about, uh, I'm not here to debate the topic, but on line 52.16, uh, where it, it increases medical assistance coverage for a service, um, where there was a prohibition on sex reassignment surgery, now this says it covers gender affirming services. Um, how can that co not cost money? Senator mm -hmm. or Mr. Burdick. I'm Chair, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the end of Senator Abler's question, if you could. Senator Abler. Well, it's line 52.16. Uh, it, it reverses the prohibition on coverage to allowing coverage. So how can that be not a cost? Mr. Burdick. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, again, Matt Burdick with the Department of Human Services. Senator Abler, to your question, this is actually um, conforming to a court decision that overturned that prohibition on coverage and oh. actually mandated coverage. So uh, medical assistance currently covers oh. these services, and this is just updating the law to reflect the current legal landscape. That's helpful. Senator Abler. Thank you. And um, there's a bunch of repealers. Um, maybe in the description you mentioned that, but. Uh, there's not, uh, in the elite all these, there's not the list, the usual 16 pages of, like you're appealing a whole bunch of rules. Um, it's, it's on page 59.7 and following. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Lisa Timian, Timian for MDH. Um, so, Senator, I believe you're talking about line 59.7, the repealer bill. The repealer section? Right. So this just contains, um, there's a, all provisions that were included in the policy bills in the language that was heard in this committee, including, um, uh, I think there was the APCD reporting and then that one that's like the huge line of things that's from the uh, FGI updates. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? 
Uh, Madam Chair. Senator Amber. I have an amendment. I can find it um, in my papers. And I showed this to Senator Wicklund last night. Uh, I'd like to move the A5 amendment. We will pass out the A5 amendments. I hope that the committee will find it friendly. And when it gets passed, I can start describing it. If Go you ahead. Be efficient. Um, there's a, the, the, the amendment uh, simply says that the commissioner, service, uh, the commissioner must uh, consult with Access Medical Center uh, to explore options to allow Access Medical Center to provide pharmacy services to medical assistance enrollees, including forming a 340B ambulatory pharmacy or a 340B contract pharmacy with a medical assistance carve-in. What that all means, this, this bill will never become law. This amendment will not be law. This is a placeholder for a discussion uh, that's already begun with the department and Dr. Chumalo, they're reaching out to him. Um, I, and so uh, if something could ever get worked out, this makes, at least the, the Senate has a position that they're trying to help Access serve better. Um, if you don't know what Access Clinic is, um, so there are three primary clinics in Minneapolis serving people in economic stress or poverty in areas to, designed as medically underserved by HRSA. Uh, they have uh, between eight and 9,000 unique patients. 83% uh, of their patients are better served in a language other than English. So they're really in a very um, challenging world. The most frequent languages are Somali, Oromo, Amharic, uh, Swahili, Arabic, and Spanish. Um, and the problem that they're facing, and I didn't, we could have testimony, I'm just in the interest of time just briefly telling you about the place. Um, but due to the confluence of poverty, transportation, language, managed care restrictions, increasing pharmacy deserts, uh, particularly around those places, and, um, and more reasons, uh, one out of three prescriptions are not filled, uh, which means people aren't being able to get their medications, and that's the problem. And so they reached out to me, um, and I'm pretty, they're an FQHC, they're really squared away, and I'm really happy for the FQHCs. They're amongst the most efficient ways to serve some of these high need, challenged populations. And so they would like to figure out a way to open an in-house pharmacy, uh, but all the rules and so on make it impossible. And so the point of this is, could they please take a run at this and see if they can come up with something? And my my pledge to the, to the chairman and to the committee, um, unless there's agreement from the chairman and everybody, DHS and the world, this just becomes an amendment that will never be adopted in any conference committee. But it would give a chance then for this group to try to come to some resolution. And so they have about a month to pull it together. And if they can't, well, then that was that. So with that, I would appreciate people's support. Senator McLender, Mr. Burdick. Uh, Madam Chair, I. I will let um, Mr. Burdick comment as well, but um, Senator Abler, I, I really do not want to add an amendment to this bill. I really would like it to move to the floor in the way that it is today. Um, I would commit to you to follow up to talk with um, Mr. Burdick about whether this conversation has started and make sure that there is a starting of the conversation. Um, and my commitment is that if you know, in another couple of weeks that it hasn't happened, I will follow up again. Um, I'm just not comfortable adding something like this to the bill, have it go to the floor and um, have to keep track of um, this as it moves forward. So I have, um, I give you my commitment to work on this with you and make sure that the communication has started. I would also have questions about whether um, there are other entities other clinics that would like to be, you know, brought into this discussion as well, and um, I would want to make sure that that happens. And Mr. Burdick can provide. Mr. Burdick, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Abler, thank you. Yes, this has actually come to our attention. I know um, Access reached out in probably the past 48 hours, and we're working on getting a meeting scheduled to talk about the pharmacy access issues. And I think we all share the goals of making sure that folks who receive their health care through medical assistance can access the pharmacy and the um, medications that they need to be healthy. And so I think we're always open to talk to any provider and provide technical assistance. And that's in process. And happy to keep you updated on where those conversations go. Thank you. Senator. Uh, Madam Chair. Um, well, I'm disappointed. 
that we can't just stick this on as a placeholder. If you're not aware, on the floor we have issues of germaneness, and I don't know how many bills that we're discussing this session that include the phrase 340B um, or FQHCs. Um, and, you know, I'll take you at your word, and I'm not going to ask for a roll call to embarrass anybody. This is just meant to be getting something done. Um, this committee is charged with the well being of well over a million people. And in the medical, we, Dr. Chumalno came up here and sat right in that chair that Senate, Mr. Burdick is sitting and talking about equity in healthcare and Medicaid. This is the classic case of equity in Medicaid to underserved populations. 83% of the people speak a language that's not the language that I speak comfortably in. Like, holy cow. And so, you don't have to do it today, but like, that's the role of our committee. And we've done all kinds of work on child licensing and little reports and little minor nibble around the edges. But there was a guy who came in, and I don't know if that story is here. Um, he didn't give me the anecdote, but there he was talking about this fellow who came in who had a stroke, and he was some kind of had some he was a glass guy or something, and. And he needed some medication, and he went, and it was complicated, and it was a $60 copay, and it shouldn't have been, and did CVS take this particular carrier or not, and they don't even speak the language. And so he went out with nothing. That guy might die. And it's going to be a statistic, and it's another equity thing, and like, well, let's do something about it. And so I'll withdraw my amendment, but if the chair and others would promise to me, if we can come up with an agreement, no one's going to challenge germaneness. If we can find some policy way, or if it needs money, then we'll have to discuss, is it in the budget that you want to spend out of, you know, $19 billion to help this place. Um, but I, I'm just challenged that here's a place that it's not even in my district, it's in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so um, I'll, uh, Senator Aki had a question. The A5 has been withdrawn, Senator Utke. No, Madam Chair, I did not withdraw yet. I, I just I want to keep said the, I want Senator Utke. Did you I not say I, I withdraw? I, I said I will, but I am not doing that yet. I'm just Senator Utke had a, had his hand up. So Senator Utke, get to this point. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, yes, I was going to weigh in on this, and uh, uh, with all due respect to what's been said, I would recommend or would like to see anyhow that it stay in, because when it's in, it it continually is in front of us. If we lay it aside and we all get, get, gets lost in the piles and piles of paperwork and all the things we um, have to look at throughout the next month, um, it is important, and uh, Senator Abler mentioned a little million plus. The front of this thing shows that uh, we're actually dealing with just short of two million people that are affected by a lot of things we do here. So um, this is one important piece that... Uh, could get lost in the shuffle, and we understand that uh, you, w what you think you'll see in the end. But I would, I'd like to see it stay, because then I think it keeps it on the table. Madam Chair, Senator Wickland. Um, Madam Chair, I um, would just respectfully ask that we don't um, amend it to the MDH policy bill that I'm trying to get um, passed to the floor and to be. It, addressing the policy needs of the Department of Health. We went through and heard the bills in committee, and we've um, asked the department to put together, you know, their their priorities in terms of MDH policy changes they'd like this year, and that's the bill that um, I would like to move forward. You have absolutely my commitment. I believe in this committee this year we've heard um, many bills that relate to medical assistance coverage and, and helping, um, helping improve equity in access to services this year. Um, I think I have demonstrated a commitment to that and I would continue, will continue as we put together the, the HHS um, omnibus budget bill to be committed to absolutely improving equity and access to um, services and um, absolutely working with Access Medical Center as an, um, you know, somebody or a, 
a clinic that does wish some specific assistance, I am absolutely committed to following up to make sure that that connection happens. I just, I do not want to include the placeholder on this bill for that. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And it's a great conversation and I'm, I'm glad this topic came up. Um, we have the largest number of people outside of Ethiopia from the Oromo community and, and it's not just in Minneapolis as Senator Abler, but these, uh, these services provided at Access are throughout not only the metro area but the state as well and, and it just uh, surprises me that when we're talking about equity that's right in, in, in this piece, it's like how can you get, and maybe this is to the department, how, you know, to Se Senator Abler's point that raises, there's an unmet, unmet need, you know, within there. And we just had a conversation regarding pharmaceuticals the other night, you know, and, and how uh, certain folks in accessing, not able to access, and, and access really does get into the access point uh, in there. And so help me understand what what the role is going forward in, in because I, I believe this is, very much important to the topic at hand when we do this, and um, wh where where are we at in that process? Uh, and, and if you can't answer that, maybe this is a follow up uh, conversation, Mr. Burdick, on it. But this is absolutely the right time to have this conversation on on, on this specific gap in equity and access gap that we need to talk about, Mr. Burdick. Uh, Madam Chair and Senator Hoffman, as I mentioned, you know, we just um, had some outreach in the past two days here from Access Medical Center, so I think we need to have that conversation with them to understand the unique needs that they're facing and are more than willing to have that. And I know I just got a message while I was sitting here at the table that that um, scheduling of that conversation is in process. And so without understanding the unique situation that this particular provider is facing, I don't feel like I can um, articulate what the right solution is. But that's the conversation we plan and commit to having. Fair enough, Ms. Madam Chair, fair enough. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I very much want to offer, uh, you know, any help I can be in that. It's just to, um, especially with the, the communities that were, that Senator Abler did mention. So I appreciate your honesty and, and looking forward in doing that. So I look forward to being part of this conversation in the future Madam as Chair. well. Senator Atke. Oh. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I just can't help myself for a little bit of clarity. Uh, I hear this referred to as it's the department's bill and such. The department brings forward the requests. Um, the bill belongs to uh, Senator Wickland and all the rest of the members around our table. So we are the ones that uh, get to pass that and I think we just need to keep that in, in mind that um, it's, it's their, their request that's coming forward but uh, we will, uh, S Senator Wickland has asked for this not to be so that's between her and uh, Senator Abler. So thank you. Senator Abler. Well, Madam Chair, I did not, I mean, the day got off to kind of a funny start, but I didn't come here to dust up the day. I just, we did and not so say I, uh, that. And so I, um, anyway, so I talked to Senator Wicklund last night. I thought she was just like, oh, fine. And so I'm not going to ask members to choose between the policy and their loyalty and whatever. And I understand how committees work. And I do not want anybody here to be forced to vote against this because of some technical reason. I want people here to be voting for things that are cool. And, and I'm, I'm comfortable. Um, I just thought it'd be like, no biggie. That's, I, that's what I thought I was walking into. And so uh, I'm here to embarrass no one and not to cause anybody to be impugned by who cares more about equity or not. But um, this access, they just reached out to me. And so I was kind of glad. And I'm, I'm glad that the department is well aware of that. And I'm sure that they're going to have that conversation and, and we can track it along. But I think it's instructive for us in the bigger picture that a lot of these places we put at the, in the center of these very challenged communities are themselves struggling to even serve. The FQHCs and others um, find it really hard even to stay open sometimes. And so um, it, it's a good discussion. And, and Sarah Wickland, uh, you're a good colleague and I take you at your word. I'm not going to mess up your bill with my amendment, and so, but I appreciate your commitment to the topic. And, and Madam Chair, now I will withdraw it. I just didn't want to take away the chance to discuss it. Um, so I'll withdraw the amendment, Madam Chair. Very good. Other conversations? Seeing none. Thanks, 
Um, Senator Wicklund's motion to take Senate File 2212 as amended be recommended to pass. Is that your motion, Senator? Um, yes, Madam Chair. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The bill is passed. 229.95. Thank you, Madam Chair. And lastly, we will take up Senate File 2995, which is the Department of Health's budget bill. Um, and I'm happy to have the Commissioner, Commissioner Cunningham, here to do the presentation of the updates to um, the Department's budget bill. Um, you will also find in your materials uh, a bill index for the budget bill. Um, if you have questions about specific provisions, and I will let uh, the commissioner move forward with her presentation. Commissioner Cunningham, always a pleasure. Please proceed. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Happy to be here with you again, um, really to lift up some new and revised versions of our, of our bill. Um, I am very pleased to be here. I'm joined by a number of MDH staff and subject matter experts who are your partners in advancing and protecting the health of Minnesotans. They will be here to answer any questions that you have about the new or revised proposals or any other aspects of our budget that may be top of mind. So I am going to just scroll through the deck to get to the uh, new and revised proposals relatively quickly. Before I get there, I just want to remind uh, the committee of our buckets, which include strengthening public health and preparedness, reducing disparities, addressing time critical prevention uh, to address emerging or worsening health threats, thinking about healthy start to our youngest Minnesotans, healthcare access, affordability, and quality, the department's current service needs, and maintaining health maintaining safe and healthy drinking water. So uh, the first set of proposals on this slide are two uh, uh, new proposals and um, uh, well, three new proposals. So we have the Equitable Health Care Task Force. Uh, it says revised there, but that is actually a new proposal. Uh, really, we, as you all have been talking about equity, as we had the conversation uh, when I previously presented here, uh, when we think about equity in health care, that it's not only about access, it's also about the quality of care um, that individuals receive, as well as their experiences of care. What this Equitable Health Care Task Force uh, proposes to do is to create uh, a roundtable for stakeholders, uh, for community members to really think about and examine inequities and how people experience health care based on race, religion, culture, sexual orientation, gender identity, and disability uh, status. We had previously talked just lifting up the last one in that list in terms of disability status. One thing that people living with disabilities often experience is a reductionistic focus just on their disability, ignoring chronic health needs or preventative care needs. I have also been in um, conversations with, as we were talking about access, Medical Center and uh, Aromo uh, speaking uh, Minnesotans. Um, I've been in conversations with uh, Muslim Minnesotans or Somali, uh, uh, specifically Somali Minnesotans who have talked about their um, experiences of healthcare discrimination. So again, this is a round table to bring all stakeholders together to really think about how we can jointly move the needle with community to address health inequities in the healthcare sector. Next is the fetal and infant mortality review. It is, this proposal aims to reestablish the fetal and infant mortality case review committee. This used to exist at MDH. We would like to start that up again, clearly, again, talking about equity, we're challenged with infant 
uh, mortality in the state and in the nation. And this um, review would help us to better understand the factors that contribute to fetal and infant mortality um, to inform the policy and systems changes that we need. The third proposal is around HIV prevention, health equity programming, the Ryan White HIV funding. So as you all uh, may be aware, there are two HIV epidemics in uh, the state that we've been tracking, uh, one in Hennepin County, Ramsey, since uh, 2020, another in the Duluth area since 2021. HIV is a preventable disease, but often tied to those who are, who are most vulnerable experiencing health inequities. And we simply do not have enough funding to stem, stem the tide. There were 298 new cases of HIV in Minnesota in 2021. Again, we don't want um, HIV is preventable. We'd like to avoid having any infections. And so uh, this will help uh, with that work. Uh, next, we have a Comprehensive Drug Overdose and Morbidity Prevention Act. You all saw this uh, previously. Again, we are challenged with a crisis in terms of opioid um, overdoses and often fatalities, particularly when we think about the American Indian communities, African American communities, and people experiencing homelessness. So uh, we, we were charged uh, repeatedly by Lulu Tim Lieutenant Governor, and rightly, to go harder, to push harder, uh, so that we can reduce uh, overdose, overdose fatalities um, in Minnesota. And so this is a bigger um, budget than what you all previously saw to really address the magnitude of the problem. So we have um, also revised uh, the budget request for home visiting. I had a very nice conversation with uh, the Family Home Visiting Coalition yesterday about all of the good work that they do around Minnesota really to improve uh, uh, pregnancy outcomes, to improve early childhood outcomes, to really address uh, social determinants of health working with, with families. And so um, this budget increases, um, increases the allocation to home visiting, which again is prevention focused um, home visiting on the part of uh, the Minnesota Department of Health. It will serve children under five and give us greater flexibility in serving high priority uh, populations with family home visiting. Next, we have family planning projects. Um, this um, is a revised uh, budget proposal. Um, again, this is a high demand program. It provides a lot of uh, preventative services, contraceptive care, pre -con uh, preconception counseling, STI uh, treatment. So it is, again, very high demand um, in our family planning uh, service agencies, special projects agencies are trusted resources serving uh, all members of our community so, to support in a very holistic way um, family planning for Minnesotans. So um, as part of the COVID uh, pandemic, we were able as, as a country to really offer people easy access to vaccination. Uh, and vaccination is key to preventing uh, communicable diseases. Um, and we simply do not have enough monies, particularly to cover those who are uh, underinsured or uninsured adults in Minnesota. So this would help provide additional funding to make sure that all adults can access those important health resources. The next one is preser preserving funding for medical education and research costs. There have been a lot of changes at the federal level through CMS, which fund funds uh, medical education and residency training programs. Um, to be in compliance with uh, the federal changes, there have to have be some shifts of um, our part of that puzzle here between DHS and MDH. And so, um, 
with that, we need to update how medical education and research cost payments will be distributed and transfer the existing uh, dental clinical innovation grant programs to a different funding source, specifically uh, the general fund. There's a budget neutral proposal to reallocate funds from fiscal year 2023 to fiscal year 2024 to complete some information and telecommunications uh, projects. And so that's a budget neutral proposal that is also now included. And, and finally, um, we have discussed in committee before the, the impacts of of lead, um, although this will not come, before, although there's a separate allocation for lead um, within our, our targets, um, this is clearly an important health issue I wanted you all, all to, to be aware of. Um, so our lead service line replacement to public health uh, facilities. This will cover um, municipal sort of mapping of the lead lines and, and, and their replacement. I will just note that we do continue to have the proposal for child care, for child care facilities separate in, in our, in, in MDH's target. Um, that would help those facilities sort of replace their plumbing and their uh, fixtures, right, that also contribute to the problems. This fixes, you know, municipal from the street to the building, but those child care facilities that are required to, to test for lead uh, need some additional support to change out um, their infrastructure to reduce the, to reduce the risk. So um, there are two proposals, but this is for the municipal community water works. And I think that is our last one. So um, I appreciate the opportunity to review our new and revised proposals. Happy to take any questions um, here with you today, me or, me or my staff. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, any questions about the presentation? Senator Rucky. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I don't know if it's, I'll start at the back, on, on the back page where it's talking, looking at the finances. Is that the same, or this is just re reflecting the adjustments, right? The, revi the revisions that you just talked about. And my uh, question there is the FY23, the 12 or 1.2 million um, credit. What is that? Commissioner Cunningham. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd have to turn it over to my staff to comment on this uh, proposal. Welcome to the committee. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Margaret Kelly. I'm Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Health. What this uh, reflects here is um, funding in fiscal 2023 that we were anticipating spending but will not spend, and we are canceling that and moving it into fiscal year 24 and 25 to make it available to spend. Thank you, Senator Rocky. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you. Um, now I'm backing up to the slide, and I guess I don't have numbers on them, but anyhow, it's the one that uh, talked about the adult vaccine and the additional funding there. Um, and I know this is an overview. If we go to the uh, budget book, is it, is, is it further defined or listed what that includes? Um, just a little concerned when it's a wide open appropriation um, under vaccine and what we've all experienced the last few years, people get a little nervous. Commissioner. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. And uh, Senator Aki, let me just, um, before we move to your question, let me just uh, take the liberty to further explain what this underspending is. So we have a telehealth study um, that's also covered in your slide deck uh, that telehealth has been so important during the pandemic. Uh, people like it, providers like it, um, and we are, as an um, organization that looks at a lot of research around healthcare quality and outcomes, 
are helping the state sort of look at the value add of telehealth. Um, that proposal has some monies that we, um, with the pandemic, were not able to use to complete the study. And so the allocation over from 2023 to 2024 is so that we can complete that really important study uh, that will demonstrate the value um, and perhaps the limitations of telehealth. One of the most important areas in which we've seen the benefit of telehealth is in mental health. Um, some preliminary data that I've looked at from the team around the use of telehealth is really bridging um, sort of the access chasm for, for mental health. And so I really do look forward to that study. So uh, while that, uh, while we do see that there, we, we, we have intended uses for those funds and, and, and I think that's high value uh, to the state. Your second question about uh, the vaccinations. So in terms of more detail about the vaccinations, um, love to hear more that is under that question. Uh, my understanding is that um, if we agree, right, that vaccinations are an important resource uh, for individuals and communities to control uh, individual risk or the spread of disease, we would like everybody to be able to access vaccinations. And simply put, everybody cannot access those. Individuals who are not insured, vaccines are actually highly costly. Um, they are important medical resource, but they are very costly, actually, still many of them. And so, um, and so we have some monies to cover uh, the uninsured and to cover those who are underinsured, but we simply do not have enough. And so um, I don't I'd have to defer to, to our staff and we can get back to you. I think that could be the best. But my understanding it, it, is it is a, a resource, a funding source to help fill in those gaps for Minnesotans so that our program can provide uh, vaccinations uh, to clinics who do serve, as we were talking about earlier, the uninsured and underinsured with vaccinations. Um, thank you, and thank mm -hmm. you for the answer, and uh, I, I'm done. Thank you. Any more questions about the presentation? Seeing none, um, to Senator Wicklund's motion to adopt the A1 amendment, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The motion prevails. Questions about the bill's numbers? Thank you. Um, Actually, I have a lot of this is a really big bill. This is not a minor bill. And Madam Chair, Madam Chair, and Madam Chair, um, there's a lot of this that's I would classify as really great ideas. Some ideas that are you know here we go again, and then some other stuff is like really controversial. Um, I saw the the deck of letters uh, supporting many of the parts. Um, but Madam Chair, is there going to be a chance for people that have concerns about this bill to testify? Senator Rickland. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, our, our approach to this is that um, we aren't going to take specific testimony on this bill uh, other than the, the ability to submit written testimony. And then if things are incorporated, we will obviously have um, ample time for people to comment on concerns or support that they have for the HHS omnibus that may include some of these provisions, probably won't include all of them. Um, we thought that would be more, um, or I thought that would be a more efficient way to have people <coughs> raise the concerns about something that is specifically, you know, included and I'm trying to advance. Senator Abel. Well, thanks. And Madam Chair, just, and I appreciate the efficiency of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I get the most benefit from testimony about people that have concerns about something. Uh, there's, I mean, if, if you like something, you know, a letter is good, but I, sometimes that dialogue is helpful. And I'm, I didn't come to debate that today, but I wish there was a chance for that. So, but I have Madam Chair, quite a Senator Wickland, Senator Abler, just a, a, in addition, you know, given the time constraints we're working under, we're trying to finish, you know, we now have our targets. We have to get the bill created. We have sure. to have that all happen. Um, and provide the ample time on that specific yeah. bill, and that's why I'm taking sure. a little bit time, less time on this specific bill. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator. And from what I just heard, too, when we have that final bill, we will have plenty of time for testimony from the public, correct? Yes, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Adler. And thanks. And just 
We're having a great day here. We're, we are we're having doing a the people's day. business. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that dialogue ahead of time with concerns uh, is important. And so if, if people have concerns about some of this stuff, then talk to me and I'll just try to pass it along. So I have a bunch of questions. This is a large bill. Um, Madam, and so the commissioner's here and so on. Uh, if you can bear with me, uh, Madam Chair. On page 21.113, this growth target thing, could somebody explain to me? That seems like there's some concerns about that. Has this been, is this being worked on with people that are going to be the subject of the growth targets? It seems like there's some uncertainty. So, Commissioner mm -hmm. or other, if you can tell me about that. Madam please. Chair, Senator, can you, um, Senator Abler, can you say again what Sure, it's the a line? page 21.13 of the base bill. It's the Healthcare Spending Growth Target Commission. And we all want or to save money. So, um, maybe, C Commissioner, can you maybe explain the process? Mm -hmm. that there's some people that are concerned about the content of this, or at least the way it's going. And are you working with them to, like, is there going to be a different product coming out of that from this, or is it even a good idea? So, so thank you. Um, clearly, this proposal will help us address rising health care costs. It is intended to be a multi-stakeholder commission. Um, I'm, I'm not sure all of who's in the audience here today, but I will say, uh, Tuesday when uh, we spoke on the bill um, within the House and they, and they were able to take a little bit of testimony there and um, a representative from the Minnesota Hospital Association did appreciate this approach and voiced her appreciation and the association's appreciation of this approach to thinking about uh, spending and health care costs. Mm -hmm. Senator Amber. Right. Well, I'm just, I read it, it's kind of vague. Uh, spending targets, you know, by hospital, by condition, by patient. Um, you know, there's, this bill is full of a lot of ideas that may or may not make a difference. Um, and so um, the way it's, you know, if, I just hope it works and that you achieve the goals that you're setting out to do. So I'll leave it at that for now. There's also, Madam Chair, on, line, on page 27, there's a healthcare spending technical advisory council. Can you tell me how that interacts with the commission? Matt and the uh, commissioner, please. Senator or commissioner. So that technical co um, committee, my understanding is, so we, we will have a commission, it'll be multi-stakeholder. The benefit of the technical advisory um, group is to give support to that commission um, when they need more information, more details, need to understand the state of the science and the state of the information in the field. So um, they will uh, provide uh, background support um, uh, for that commission. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Senator Abler. One well, thanks. Uh, then you have the, um, on page 29, 18.18, you have the strategies for reductions of administrative spending and low value care. Um, I don't mind identifying low value care and administrative strategies, um, but it seems like a lot of this stuff could be rolled together as a project and so that people would know where to go with this. And as you create more and more layers of people working on things, you get silos again and the you're, you're maybe going to get less than what you think. So, I, Commissioner, do you want to comment about that? Senator. Madam Chair, sure. uh, Senator Abler, I think that, that the benefit of this is that people are going to come together, work with that technical advisory committee, and come together and brainstorm with good information and good multi-stakeholder input about what we can do as a state to curb these growing and escalating healthcare costs. Um, as you recall, when I presented sort of the introduction to NMDH, those costs just continue to skyrocket. As we sort of project into the future, everything continues to go up, and what we want to do is bend the curve. Yeah, Madam, Madam Chair. Senator Amler, and I'm Senator, all for that. I'm oh. just suggesting that the low value stuff could be rolled into the commission, and they could just kind of mm -hmm. have one, one stop shopping. But. Senator Wickland. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, I just wanted to also mention that the bill I presented yesterday, Senate File 2002, um, and I'm not sure, maybe you weren't in the, I don't, maybe that was when you had to step away, but I talked about that. My approach is, is similar to the, the governor's proposal approach, but um, we would work together to figure out what the best way to implement a, a 
type of commission that could have oversight um, and take in analysis. Yes, the, the um, looking at administrative costs or low value care, that would be something that would be a task of that entity to, to take on, yeah. as well as maybe looking at um, spending targets as we move further along in terms of understanding all of the healthcare spending. Um, I think the first part of this um, would be to establish what data do we need to collect and how do we make sure we understand the data we have already and you know make sense of it and then we can talk about targets for you know reducing um, in low value care or containing costs through a target yeah Senator Adler. well thank you and I, I appreciate that and I just you know I don't know where you're going Senator Wickland and the department brings ideas and then we think about them and um, it's, some of these Projects in the in the in the legislation and commission are, are really large projects, and it may well be you spent a good deal of time in the department thinking about this, but then you bring it out here and then oh we hadn't thought of that and hadn't thought of that and let's make it work better. I think we're trying to go the same way, so I hope you see my comments as friendly, uh, Madam Chair. Senator, um, there's a ton of data talked about in this bill uh, about all kinds of things um, in the. Um, and, and so I presume this bill is going to go to judiciary if any of the data is actually going to move along or if it's if we're not doing any data collection differences it doesn't have to go there but is that I mean I there's um I mean I just just skimming it uh, on page 58.8 it says data and data and data about um, it just talks about system well I'll just ask a question commissioner specifically on page 58.8 you're systematically collecting data to identify and analyze and interpret the impact, incidents, et cetera, of um, outcomes related to in utero exposure to maternal substance use. What kind of data, who would you be getting data from? Does this give you the right to go into their health records and pull out information about their past and their relationships and all that? Commissioner. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Abler. Uh, I will turn to my staff to, to, if anyone's here, to comment on the data collection for that specific item. And while you're there, you can also maybe just on the same section, um, line 5811 talks about data from hospitals and providers caring for pretty much everybody. Thank you. Please introduce yourself. Welcome. All right. Noya Woodrich with the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, so looking at the, the data collection as it relates to the Comprehensive Drug Overt Overdose and Morbidity Prevention Act, um, in the division in which I work, Child and Family Health, we're looking to um, explore how we might collect data as it pertains to um, NAS babies, so neonat neonatally, um, abstinence syndrome. sorry, thank you, <laughs> abstinence syndrome uh, babies. We don't, uh, we really are in this plan being intentional about taking the time to talk to all the stakeholders to understand how we can best do that. But right now we do not have information about the number of babies that are born addicted to substances and then what are the impacts of, um, the long-term impacts of, of, of being born addicted to a substance. So we're looking at how can we collect that type of data. Senator? All right, well, no, I, I where are the time? We have a little bit of time yet to talk about this. I have a number of other things we need to talk about. But like on 57.8, it says the commissioner shall establish a comprehensive program. And then coming on the next page, it says, uh, is it, are you coming up with a plan to collect the data or are you collecting the data? So, uh, Ms. Woodridge. Uh, chair and committee members, again, for there's several pieces in here and there's several divisions in the department that are involved in this particular um, uh, 
project. For child and family health, we are going to be planning on how we can best collect that data. And I'll maybe let um, Mark speak to some of the other pieces. Madam Chair, Senator Abler, Mark Kindy, Minnesota Department of Health, Health Promotion, Chronic Disease, working in partnership with the other divisions on this. Um, for the most part, the data that are being collected are, well, we're analyzing them on an aggregate basis. The data come from the Minnesota Hospital Association. We're looking at the codes that identify exposure, as Noya said. And so we're, but we're going through this process to, to plan to meet with partners, with, with providers who are diagnosing um, on, on the individual level, but who are reporting in, in aggregate. And so we're looking at the administrative data and deciding and discerning what variables to be collected and analyzed so that we understand the magnitude of the problem across the state. Thank you. Uh, Madam Senator Chair. And I have no qualms about what you're trying to do, but I'm just pointing out what the words say. And I've just looked at this thinly, but on, on page 58.5 it says design it. So, so you're shell establishing a program. You're, you're establishing a, a program on line 57.8. And on line 58.5, you're designing a system to assess. Um, and then on line 58.6 it says specifically the commissioner of health may systematically collect data to identify. It doesn't talk about aggregate data. It doesn't talk about, it's just, it's not narrowly written. And so, you know, Senator Wickland, if this goes as part of your bill, this needs to be involved at judiciary and to figure out what this means. And so it's, it's as narrow as you say. So I'm, I really didn't come to dust up today, but I appreciate that. So just put that on your note. And, and if you look at the, all the data collections in the bill, to make sure that they're as narrow as they must be, but they truly protect people's privacy and their ability to opt in if they want and, their, and all that. So, um, Madam Chair, there's, um, there's a new thing in the bill uh, about sentinel event, sentinel event reviews involving law enforcement. One, one oh, moment. Did somebody else have a question? Yeah. yeah, can I give a little bit of space to the other members right now and I'll come oh, back sorry, to you? Yeah. Perfect, Senator Hoffman. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, thank you. If, you know, when you talk about budgets and capturing, I, I'm pretty impressed. Nice to see you, Noah. It's been a few years. So, um, the um, Senator Cunningham, um, thank you for showing that it can be done to where you capture money and, and put it in. You know, it'd be nice if there was a bill to be able to capture some money and help move people's targets a little higher. But I had some notes in here on the, on the council that you're creating. First of all, thank you for that. There's a notation in here that now I can't find it, but I'll just tell you what it is because I kind of remember. Not that I would know anything about Title V, Commissioner, but in, um, in the duties of your council, you specifically highlight that how that's going to impact people with disabilities, right? And we know that there's built-in ableism in our systems, mm -hmm. right? And yet, when you look at the makeup of the council, I kind of found it a hard stretch to see where we're including that. And, and we know that um, under our provisions uh, that, you know, 30% of our discussion when it comes to children and youth, with children and youth actually, in anything under Title V, it should be, you know, one-third should be concerning people with special health care needs. So in your council, I don't see anybody that would have some kind of um, background, right, that's, that's called out into it, yet the duties that we have three pages later specifically uh, address those inequities that, that exist out there. So help me understand how you're going to assure that somebody on that council um, speaks the language that, I don't know, a few of us understand when it comes to the unique individualized needs of a person with a disability and how it affects their life in general. So uh, I just wanted to point that out. I know where you are on intersectionality. I'm not seeing intersectionality in that council, and I'm not seeing disability, especially when one of the duties are existing in there. So does that uh, help me understand that? Madam Senator, can you um, just tell, tell me what page... I, I'm just wondering what council, so or the name of the council at least, because yep. I'm not sure which one you're talking about. Yeah. Um, no, 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 I wish I'd keep my notes. Maybe you know. um, 
go to the next person, uh, Madam the Chair. Technical, and then I'll is it the it. technical advisory on 2729, or is it the... Madam Chair, there's so much paper in front of me. Or I'm is just it like, the... the the Growth Target Commission on 2113. So you're looking at page, if you look at uh, line 29.15, see what it says? And then when you take a look at. So this is the Technical, technical advisory, advisory Council. Yep. And, and, and again, I'm, I'm just trying to get uh, a systems look at the fact if we are going to we're going to do something and we know some of our charges are. Um, I want to know, you know, who's going to be at the table, right? Um, you know, if we were going to have a conversation on Gretsch drums, I would be the one that would be at the table to talk about Gretsch drums because I was once an endorsed drummer of Gretsch, right? And so I can tell you how the plies of maple are there. But you get a drummer that's in here that doesn't understand that, they're not going to understand what six-ply maple versus one-piece maple is, right? I'm going to know that. Same thing if you want to talk about, I don't know, pick a law, Public Law 94-142. I'll school you on that because of the work that I did in that. But in this case, you're, you're looking at a, a, a committee that's going to make a decision about somebody who has a certain characteristic, in this case, uh, an individual with a disability. And as we're getting in our minutia of conversations, Madam Chair, a lot of times that isn't a purposeful and an intentional conversation. And in this case, I want to make sure that we're coming back to what our intentional or purposeful conversation is. And I think the commissioner, I know where she sits in, in her conversation of intersectional, because we had that conversation. I just want to make sure it's embedded in here. Is that, and she's smiling, so she's already got the answer. Mm -hmm. I, I, thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Hoffman. I appreciate that. You know, um, so this is um, the draft bill as we have it today. It is not final. I think I would encourage uh, you and my staff uh, to follow up about um, the membership on the council. Um, I, I definitely understand and appreciate, and you see my smile, because I do appreciate an inclusive table when we are making uh, decisions. And so um, with that, if it is uh, satisfactory to uh, the committee, I'd like to have my staff follow up with you after about that membership. Senator Hoffman. Madam, Madam Chair, members, yeah, I could probably... Yes, I appreciate I appreciate your work. And by the way, hats off for finding that extra money. It'd be nice if we could all find that extra money. Not that I would say that, but you know, it would be nice to. So good job, Senator Abler. Back okay. to you, I, Madam Chair. I was not trying to monopolize the day. Just, it's, it seems like the habit is I have a lot of questions. And anyway, um, so I'm. If somebody else wants to interrupt, I'm happy to let them do that. So. Um, so, uh, Commissioner, could you please tell me, Madam Chair, Commissioner, could I talk about the Sentinel event reviews and the law enforcement encounters? And I'm just curious that public safety is not on your group, but um, who has, uh, I imagine there's maybe some controversy to this, um, certainly interest in figuring it out. And I. Um, Are you looking at a line in the bill? Well, it's in the amendment, Madam Chair, um, page uh, line 1.3 of the amendment, of the A1 amendment. And then just the whole topic, can you just, I'm interested that the Department of Health is the one that's choosing to take this on and how public safety is not part of that. And so if you can just maybe just discuss the theme of what you're trying to do and what your product will be at the end that you could export. Thank you. Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Abler. Um, I think every time that we um, witness um, or hear about or learn of a death um, in a encounter with law enforcement. It, it troubles um, the community, certainly um, any death that is potentially preventable as a certain subset of these likely are. Um, we would like to bring our resources, our expertise, our skills to bear um, because it's not only um, painful in uh, for individuals and communities, but um, as we have seen in the public discourse when this has happened time and time again, 
It is also law enforcement has um, voiced a commitment to learning. Um, and what we can provide in this space is our public health science approach, which is an ecological, we call it a socio-ecological approach. It looks at a number of factors, um, probably from uh, individual variables, from uh, factors within the encounter itself, factors within the community and the policy environment to really bring additional information um, so that we, when deaths are preventable, that we can prevent those deaths and prevent um, um, the not only harm of the death itself, but the ripples and the currents um, across individuals and communities, and particularly um, the challenges that then bubble up um, between relationships between law enforcement and the communities that they serve. And so at the Minnesota Department of Health, our goal is to be a, a, a resource, right, to, to, to do the science, to do it right, to do it thoughtfully, and to do it in partnership, um, and to do it with community who have um, been highly interested in a proposal like this, as you might imagine. Um, and um, as we think about who um, will be on the Sentinel Event Review Committee, we do need a balance, and, we, and we've tried to include a, a balance of experts that, again, can help us with uh, the public health approach uh, to the question, um, which probably has some similarities and differences from traditional law enforcement approaches, but always recognizing um, that we want to be a resource to the whole community and to public safety as we bring this information forward. Um, Mark Kendi is, uh, has led this proposal with other persons on our uh, staff, and so I'd invite Mark to comment if he would like to. Mr. Kendi. Thanks so much, Madam Chair. Thanks, Commissioner. Senator Abler, um, the lead partner with us is the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension um, within the department, our Department of Public Safety. And so we've worked extensively over the past uh, year and a half, two years in talking this through and working through how this would work out. And Commissioner, you described it perfectly in the approach. So thank you so much. Senator. Well, I appreciate that. I. Um, this is not, I'm not known to be an expert on this topic, but I'm highly interested, like we all are, this, the, the shootings and like, it's, you wanna just weep too often. And like, anyway, I don't understand sometimes um, how it even comes to pass, um, like really. Um, but so just on the, the nuts and bolts of it, I get back to the data question. Um, if this is going to move, it has to go to judiciary. Um, I don't know if you're going to pick it up in your bill or if this bill is going there, but on page 3.1 of the amendment, um, it's just wide open data about everybody and everything. And I don't know if you've realized what you're asking for. Uh, on line 3.1, it says the commissioner has access to the following data for a specific case review. And it goes through a really long list. Uh, police investigative data, that's easy enough. Uh, autopsy records, well, that might be kind of private. Somebody, death certificates. Records of social services provided to the victim. Is that really something that they're going to just, that you should just get to know without them giving you permission? Uh, even the perpetrator who still has rights. Another victim who was threatened. What, uh, medical records of the decedent, employment records of the law enforcement officer, corrections data. Um, I mean, there's a lot of data. And not only that, on, on line 3.16, you can subpoena the, to compel the production of any of those records. That is not minor. And if you're going to do this, again, this, is, this topic is so sensitive and so challenging from so many points of view, including the ones that you've referenced in just our passion and grief, um, that it has to be done really well if you're going to do it. And this is not constrained enough, and if it, Madam Chair Wickland, if, if this um, moves, it has to go to judiciary to be scrutinized about how that goes. So um, this, there's more things I wanted to ask about. Um, so I, and I appreciate what you're trying to do, um, but this is a, a thick stack of new stuff that you want to work. And 
I appreciate the enthusiasm of the department in bringing it forward. I just also would comment that, Commissioner, I don't know if you, I know you guys are busy, but neither the lead on this committee nor I have been briefed on this bill for 10 seconds, which is why you're getting all these questions now. And um, there was, it would be useful, and I appreciate the meetings we've had, you and I personally, and that was very nice. Uh, but as bills come forward, especially as substantial as this, private meetings with members to ask our questions and even take advice about how it might be improved uh, would just eliminate some of this discussion today. So, uh, Madam Chair, I have, um, I'm going to just kind of have to shrink down my questions. Um, uh, there's a, in here someplace, is this social determinants of health still in here? Um, I don't know what page it's on, but I'm curious about that. Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Within the Sentinel events, just for clarification. So, um, Can you be more specific? No, I don't. Well, I just know. Well, I just, uh, somebody who couldn't testify today uh, brought it to my attention that there's uh, the social determinants of health. Um, collection of, it, it's about uh, data from everybody. It's about personal lifestyle income, educational, behavioral. Um, question. Is that, do you know, I do not know where that is. Anymore. So again, I, I can turn this over to, to Mr. Kendi. Um, if this is in regard, so social determinants of health regards sort of that whole list of uh, factors. Um, it is a broad category for some of the ways that we um, operationalize what I described to you as the socio-ecological model. Um, and so that's the, that's the language rather than saying sort of socio-ecological model to the extent that um, that is what I believe um, the social determinants of health refers to in, in the language, but I'll let Mr. Kendi yeah. speak to well, it. Madam Commissioner, I, I'm just uh. in the interest of time. So, um, so I, I, it, I was pointed out it's on line 1.14, that term. And so where does it talk about what you're going to collect for data about that? Is Mr. Kendi? That would be helpful. Madam Chair, Senator Abler, so that's, this will be the first time that social determinants of health is defined in statute, and so we thought important to link that to the, the phrase that our commissioner described is when we take the social, social ecolog ecological approach, it's really looking at all of those factors from um, education, income, uh, community, and the factors that contribute to the event happening prior to 911 being called. So it's all of those, it's the ups, upstream factors where we have a chance as a health department to make a difference long term. And so it's defining the social determinants of health that are those undergirding, those foundational contributors. All right. And so, Madam Chair, my concern, and I appreciate that. I, I, you know, again, this is nice to have the discussion. Um, but I, so as you collect those, as you write your laws, your, your proposed legislation, it's really important that people are allowed to say, you don't get to know that about me. Um, it's my business, whatever long list of things it is you want to know about me, I don't have to tell you anything, or I want to tell you everything. And so just beware, please, that people have to uh, maintain some of their privacy. And, and Madam Chair, finally, I'll just take on my, a topic that um, we've discussed many times. And there's many more things this bill could be discussed. We could actually spend two hours going through climate resiliency and the African health uh, something you have in here, which I'm interested in that. Um, and so many efforts to reach into subsets, which maybe could be part of a... I want it to work. But anyway, uh, Commissioner, you and I spoke about positive alternatives. Uh, in this bill, you're, you're repealing that on page 2R. Uh, 145.4235, and I am, just find that to be, I told you this before, uh, personally I find that to be offensive. I, this is a program, and it's the governor, whoever the governor is, is calling it duplicative. And I will remind you it is not. Uh, there is no program, and they're arguing that they don't suggest that the person might get an abortion. Um, and uh, abortions are not like any kind of like light-hearted thing to do, and I believe we would all agree on that. Um, this, people said, well, if you want to have less abortions, then why don't you worry about the, the woman and the family and, and take them from here to here to here to here to uh, throughout the process and support them. This does that. This was the one common element that we found, whatever year we passed this, that 
the people on all sides could agree on, like, well, how about if we have fewer of them? And how about if, if you don't, if you're inclined not to have one, an abortion, how about if we support you through and like become your extended family and, and, and work? Um, Senator Adler, where, where are you looking in the bill? Uh, page 2R in the repealer section. Uh, it's 140, it's the second, it's the first full item there, 145.4235. And so I'm just suggesting to you, and we spoke about this in private, this is a good program. I don't think anybody wants more abortions. So let's have less. Let's keep something that works. And I know that there's a proposal and a different bill to, to change the function and make these people talk about things that they are going to be really challenged to talk about, um, to be fully comprehensive. Uh, but they're not comprehensive. This is a place that's trying to help you get through it and, and enjoy the, the joy of a, a child at the end of the pipeline, and then keep helping you through the development of that child for a little while. And so I just, I don't know, you don't have to react to that. I, I don't know why in this bill we're still abolishing um, informed consent and all that. We've discussed that enough in this committee. Um, Senator Abler, I'm very sorry to interrupt. Yeah. But in the interest of time, uh, this bill will be laid over. I do have other members with questions. Okay. I'll uh, just finish up and then I'll be done. Okay. Um, this is supposed to be a health committee. We've spent ample time discussing abortion. You passed a law. Can we talk about how to help people live better? Um, young mothers and fathers, um, people with challenges. You heard the discussion about access. Let's talk about that more. Uh, I like your ideas about trying to contain costs. I'm trying to be part of the solution. Um, and it's hard to do that in a short amount of time in a committee. So, Madam Chair, thank you very much. Thank you. Senator Ucke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And maybe before I get into my questions, I'm, I just heard you say we're going to lay this over. But what will be the path? Because some of the questions I'm going to, are things I have concerns on are the same things that uh, Senator Abler brought up and the fact that there's a lot of stuff here that goes before judiciary. Senator Where will that Wicklund. fall into line? Um, Madam Chair, Senator Utke, the plan is to lay the bill over. If there are proposals that we decide to include into, in the HHS omnibus, I will take that into consideration, um, you know, what other analysis is needed. And once that bill is drafted, we'll have an entire committee hearing about it. Correct. Okay. That's correct. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Senator Wickland. So then as, right, and some of these things in hopefully won't make it through to that bill, but just a few things that I saw that I would like to um, have so that hopefully um, we don't do this. Because I see um, the Department of Health, this is an all bringing forth an all-out assault on law enforcement. Uh, with this access to data as I run through there, the number of times law enforcement is brought up and accessing their data um, is very concerning. And then going to Section 39, which has already been mentioned, but uh, deaths associated with law enforcement encounters, uh, I don't believe we have any business doing anything related to that in health. Uh, we have a public safety committee. Um, they do more than enough there already. Um, and just because we, we are getting kind of short on time, that's the gist of it. I just, this amendment, as I started to go through it, um, it was just one thing after the other that I thought was um, controversial and things that uh, we definitely need more discussion on. And uh, I see a lot of it needs to go to other stops before we could ever uh, bring it to the floor. So uh, I just hope that we get a chance to uh, talk about those and hopefully uh, lose some of these in the process. Otherwise, uh, judiciary will have a long day in front of them. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, Senator Wickland or Commissioner, any final thoughts? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Ucke, uh, this is certainly not an assault on law enforcement. Rather, we are offering ourselves up, our technical expertise, our resource, um, our talent to, to think with and be a resource to, to law enforcement. Um, again, as Mr. Kenny has noted, this has been done in, in partnership with the Bureau of Criminal, Criminal Apprehension. Um, we've had these discussions going on for over a year. I think the whole community 
uh, law enforcement and non-law enforcement are concerned with what we're seeing in terms of um, of deaths and law enforcement encounters. So um, we want to work together here. So I definitely would not characterize it as an all-out assault. And um, the information that you see that we are um, that we would request to get is so that we have all of the variables at play, and some of that would only be available um, from uh, records on the law enforcement side. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And I, I see this as a huge gap that we're currently having, right? The, uh, the lack of a public health approach to this issue um, in preventing death, working on prevention, preventing death, and preventing the traumatic, uh, re-traumatizing, I should say, of certain communities. Um, having said that, uh, 2995 will be laid over. And seeing no further business in front of the committee, we are adjourned. Thank you.